Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Fireside Tales with Wolfgang, number 38. Uh, this one is going to be all about the one and only Stephen Crane. A lot of people know Stephen Crane from uh, elementary school, junior high maybe. Um, not sure what what level of education people are are usually exposed to his seminal work, The Red Badge of Courage, but it is definitely required reading for a lot of uh, basic education in school systems. Um, ironically, I, I don't think I actually had to read it in school. I think I think I just did. It just seemed like one of those 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 gaps in uh, uh, in my education that I had to fill on my own. Um, <clears throat> Hello, Amanda. Lovely Beatles show. Oh, Emily Thatcher, are you uh, are you? Logging in at work is that just finished day day four of seven days working straight almost done. Yeah Emily's probably sneaking her phone at work and uh, I think I saw it float by that uh, Kelsey got a job. Did I see that correctly? I'll be updated ask the weeks uh, as the week goes on, it's training week for me starting Wednesday, looks like. Looks like Kelsey Blaine Gibson got a new job. All right. Congratulations. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, Emily's off work now. Well, cool. Um, <clears throat> so um, I asked the question uh, on uh, Facebook when I just posted about this evening's show, you know, the red badge of courage. Well, what else did Stephen Crane write? If you looked real close at the thumbnail, you see he wrote something called The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky. Uh, this he published in 1898. So this one goes way back there. And um, damn this thing, I guess he wrote this or uh, he must have published it at least uh, when he was 26 uh, because he died at the age of 28 in uh, 1900. Um, Stephen Crane, I'm going to read you a little highlight here of um, a few things Wikipedia had to say about the guy. <clears throat> Best known for the Red Badge of Courage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, yes, I have tea and I'm not drinking it. Yo, hey, Gavin. Thanks for joining us, man. Good to see you. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, before I, I dive in, Totally, I should uh, point out. Uh, so this coming weekend, as most people know, we're going to be doing a um, Vaudacity Channel a couple of live shows in person in Orange County. That'll be on Friday night and Saturday night. Uh, so there will be an in-person, um, at least 45 minutes, love cast on Friday. And then on Saturday, there's going to be a whole live Polly's picnic. Um, Friday, I'm going to be accompanied um, by Amanda Benjamin's show. Uh, Amanda, who's in the chat now, the Pickers Circle with Mike and Nicole Pierce. Uh, there's going to be an improv show. Uh, as I said, there'll be like a, a 45 minute edition of the Lovecast. And Paul Carganilla is going to do. Um, uh, in the cove, or rather, I think he's, he's now updated it to out of the cove. And, um, and here's the one that you probably have not heard of 
on July 17th, I'll be doing a private concert in the, um, uh, at the same place, actually. Uh, just a one-man solo show, and uh, we'll be grilling and uh, drinking, and uh, yeah, it'll be, a, it'll be a much longer program. Uh, but that'll be sat Saturday the 17th. There is an event. Uh, it's a private event, but you can get tickets. You can come. Um, the event is posted on Facebook. If you need the details and have not seen them yet, private me, uh, private message me on Facebook, and I will forward it to you. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, Kelsey, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing about the, the update about your first week of work. That's great. And Patty Pinkstad just chimed in that it's on my calendar. Lovely. Oh, Emily just put in a request for the 17th off. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I know I've fallen into... Uh, I've, I've fallen into Paul Carganilla's grip speech. Only grips, say, program. Um, Yeah, Christy, that'd be pretty damn neat if you all, if you and Nick just kind of relocated Orange County or Venice at the least. Um, so, I was just starting to tell you all and a preface here about Mr. Stephen Crane. Um, so, he was born just after the Civil War. I guess the, uh, the Civil War was a recent memory in his upbringing, uh, the, the way so many people of our generation, or of my generation, were grown, grew up in the, uh, in the wake of Vietnam. So, it was clearly very much uh, part of the, the, the public consciousness at that point. Um, Crane wrote the Red, the Red Badge of Courage in 1895. He was a poet, he was a novelist, he was a short story writer, as you're about to hear. Uh, interestingly enough, he was a war correspondent. Prolific throughout his short life, he wrote notable works in the realist tradition, as well as early examples of American naturalism and impressionism. Even though Crane was almost forgotten for a couple of decades, decades. He's now recognized by modern critics as one of the most innovative writers of his generation. His writing definitely influenced 20th century writers like Ernest Hemingway. <clears throat> Crane was plagued by financial difficulties and ill, and Ill health, and uh, then he eventually succumbed to tuberculosis in a black forest sanatorium in Germany at the age of 28. <clears throat> uh, black forest is a little place you can go to in, in Germany. It's not like he just like literally died in the woods. Uh, Stephen Crane had a propensity for wanting to tell it like it is. So his, his style is this really down to earth, digestible, real type of writing. He didn't try to put any spin on the people he reported on. He didn't fancify the characters in his fiction. Now, this is a cool detail. As a war correspondent, he disdained trying to embellish in order to glorify war, unlike so many of the other reporters of his time. Um, as I said earlier, most of you have heard of or read his, 19, <clears throat> his 1895 novel, The Red Badge of Courage, even though he wrote this without any actual battle experience. Civil War veterans praised him for his uncanny ability to imagine and reproduce the sense of actual combat. Uh, even fewer of us, uh, myself included, I've only read about this, this next little piece. Few of us have heard of his hard-hitting novella, Maggie, A Girl on the Streets. Uh, this was considered really risque for the time. It portrays a young woman who has depressing circumstances, uh, like being abandoned, um, 
uh, being abandoned by her betraying friends, a drunken mother who shoves her out. Uh, she's the, 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 the thesis here is she, she's so caught up in the cycle of poverty that she finally turns to prostitution. And of course, these topics, these themes have been written about before, but, the, but in the US, it was never done with such realism in style and detail. So this novella, Maggie, A Girl in the Streets, is considered the first work of American literary naturalism. But get this ironic detail, um, Crane's father, was not only like a minister, but like a really, really conservative ministers, even as Christian ministers go. He disdained alcohol. He disdained like frivolous enjoyments, like the theater and like novels. Um, but for better or for worse, um, his father didn't live to know about Stephen Crane's writing career. So. Here we are in 1896. Crane has received international and national acclaim, but he decides to appear as a witness in the trial of a suspected prostitute uh, who was an acquaintance of his named Dora Clark. His reputation after that just plummeted. <clears throat> Obviously, it must have uh, plummeted amongst people that hadn't read the parts of the Bible of like Jesus hanging out with prostitutes. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, let ye who is free of st sin cast the first stone and uh, plenty of proverbial stones were then cast at Mr. Stephen Crane. Later that same year, Crane accepted a job to travel to Cuba as a war correspondent and he met a lady named Cora Taylor. And get this, Cora Taylor is recognized as the first woman war correspondent. So Crane then spent the most of the rest of his short life with her. When Cora and Stephen moved to Sussex, England, they were close friends with uh, people like Joseph Conrad, Henry James, and get this, H.G. Wells. Just like Casual friends. Um, so <clears throat> the last thing I'll say about this as we launch in to, uh, to tonight's story is just a point on style and Crane's, let's, let's see, I, I guess this would say, uh, this would be like Crane's societal ethics. So Crane's writing style is, is unique, it's compelling, he juxtaposes the soft and the hard. You're going to hear and see that in this upcoming story here in a few minutes. <clears throat> His descriptions of landscapes are almost lyrical poetry. In the development of, of his characters, he uses an unapologetic realism mixed with touches of sardonic irony. This comes most likely from Crane's early plights with society from his experience as a war correspondent, and most importantly, and here's how we delve into the relevant ethics that you will hear in this story, um, most importantly from his views that every individual deserves equality. No one is superior or inferior to another. Now, that is, that is really significant, um, particularly in his time. In his time, he would have been, again, we're, we're in the wake of the Civil War. The slaves have just been freed. And he really, truly embraces equality amongst human beings. Um, <clears throat> so it... It has to be noted that uh, this particular story I'm about to read uses the word Negro a couple of times. And this is the time um, where this was just simply the nice, politically correct 
term for a human being of this ethnic background. It's not intended to be derogatory. It's not intended in any way to shape or form to be a slight. And um, uh, I just wanted to put that out there lest you be distracted um, by the term as it flits across a couple of characters. Uh, because, yeah, I can't emphasize that part enough that Crane's outlooks, Crane's outlook on human beings is one of inherent equality. So, with that microphone adjustment... Published in 1898, this is The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky by Stephen Crane. One. The great Pullman was whirling onward with such dignity of motion that a glance from the window seemed simply to prove that the plains of Texas were pouring eastward. Vast flats of green grass, dull, huge spaces of mesquite and cactus, little groups of frame houses, woods of light and tender trees, all were sweeping into the east over the horizon. A newly married pair had, bordered this, had boarded this train at San Antonio. The man's face was reddened from many days in the wind and sun, and as a direct result of his new black clothes, that his brick-colored hands were constantly performing a uh, most self-conscious fashion. From time to time, he looked down respectfully at his own attire, he sat with a hand on each knee, like a man waiting in a barber shop. The glances he devoted to other passengers were furtive and a little shy. The bride was not pretty, nor was she very young. She wore a dress of blue cashmere with, with small reservations of velvet here and there, and with steel buttons abounding, she continually twisted her head to regard her puff sleeves, who were very stiff, straight, and high. They actually embarrassed her. It was quite apparent that she had cooked, and that she expected to cook dutifully. The blushes caused by the careless scrutiny of some passengers as she had entered the car were strange to see upon this plain, underclass countenance, which was drawn in placid, almost emotionless lines. They were evidently very happy. Ever been in a parlor car before? He asked, smiling with delight. No. She answered, I never was. It's fine, ain't it? Well, well, great. And then, after a while, we'll go forward to the diner and get a big layout. Get the finest meal in the world. Charge one dollar. Oh, do they? Cried the bride. They, 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 they charge a dollar? Why, <laughs> that's too much for us, ain't it, Jack? Not this trip, anyhow. He answered bravely. We're going to go the whole thing. Later, he explained to her about the train. You see, it's a thousand miles from one end of Texas to the other. And this train runs right across it and never stops but four times. He had the pride of an owner. He pointed out to her the dazzling fittings of the coach, and in truth, her eyes opened wider as she contemplated the sea-green figured velvet, 
the shining brass, silver, glass, the wood that gleamed as darkly brilliant as the surface of a pool of oil. At one end, a bronze figure sturdily held a support for a separated chamber, and at convenient places on the ceiling were frescoes in olive and silver. To the minds of the pair, the surroundings reflected the glory of their marriage that morning in San Antonio. This was the environment of their new estate. And the man's face, in particular, beamed with an elation that made him appear ridiculous to the Negro porter. This individual, at times, surveyed them from afar with an amused and rather superior grin. On other occasions, he bullied them with skill in ways that did not make it exactly plain to them that they were being bullied. He subtly used all the manners of the most unconquerable kind of snobbery. He oppressed them, but of this oppression, they had paid really small attention and had even less knowledge. And they speedily forgot that unfrequently a number of travelers covered them with stares of just derisive enjoyment. Historically, there was supposed to be something infinitely humorous in their situation. We're due in yellow sky at 342, he said, looking tenderly into her eyes. Oh, are we? She said, as if she had not been aware of it. To evince surprise at her husband's statement was part of her wifely amiability. She took from a pocket a little silver watch, and as she held it before her and stared at it with a frown of attention, the new husband's face shone. I bought it in San Antonio from a friend of mine, he told her gleefully. It's uh, 17 minutes past 12, she said looking up at him with a kind of shy and clumsy coquetry. A passenger noting this play smiled sardonically. At last they went to the dining car. Two rows of Negro waiters in dazzling white suits surveyed their entrance with the interest and also the equanimity of men who had been forewarned. The pair fell to the lot of a waiter who happens to feel pleasure in steering them through their meal. He viewed them with the manner of a fatherly pilot, his countenance radiant with benevolence. The patronage entwined them with the ordinary deference, but it was just not palpable to them. And yet, as they returned to their coach, they showed in their faces a sense of escape. To the left, miles down a long purple slope was a little ribbon of mist where moved the restless Rio Grande. A train was approaching it at an angle and the apex was yellow sky. Presently, it was apparent that as the distance from yellow sky grew shorter, the husband became commensurately restless. His brick-red hands were more insistent in their prominence. Occasionally, he was even rather absent-minded and far away when the bride leaned forward and addressed him. As a matter of fact, Jack Porter, Jack Potter, was beginning to find the shadow of his action to weigh upon him like a leaden slab. He, the town marshal of Yellow Sky, a man known, liked, and feared in his corner. A prominent person had gone to San Antonio to meet a girl he believed he loved, and there, after the usual prayers, had actually induced her to marry him without consulting Yellow Sky for any part of the transaction. He was now bringing his bride before an innocent and unsuspecting community. So, side note, marriage was such a big deal in this time and place that this guy, a lawman, the town, the town marshal, felt guilty in his office as a public servant for not 
asking the town's permission or at least like letting them know that he was going to get married and come back with a wife. It's that, that big a deal, right? <clears throat> of course, people in Yellow Sky married as it pleased them in accordance with the general custom, but such was Potter's thought of his duty to his friends or of their idea of his duty or of an unspoken form which does not control men in these matters that he felt he was reprehensible. He felt he had committed an extraordinary crime face to face with this girl in San Antonio and spurred by his sharp impulse, he had gone headlong over all the social hedges. He knew full well that his marriage was an important thing to this town. It could only be exceeded by the burning of the new hotel. His friends would not forgive him. He had reflected upon the advisability of telling them by telegraph, but he feared to do that, and now the train was hurrying him toward a scene of amazement, glee, and reproach. He glanced out of the window at the line of haze swinging slowly in toward the train. Yellow Sky had a kind of brass band which played painfully to the delight of the populace. He laughed without heart as he thought of it. If the citizens could dream of his prospective arrival with his bride, they would parade the band at the station and escort them amid cheers and laughing congratulations to his adobe home. He resolved that he would journey simply and quietly from the station to his house. Once within that safe abode, he could issue some sort of vocal bulletin and then not go among the citizens until they had time to wear off a little of their enthusiasm. The bride looked anxiously at him. What, what's worrying you, Jack? He laughed again. I ain't worrying, girl. I'm only thinking of yellow sky. She flushed in comprehension. A sense of mutual guilt invaded their minds and uh, developed a finer tenderness. They looked at each other and their eyes had a soft mutual glow. But Potter often laughed the same nervous laugh. The flush upon the bride's face seemed quite permanent. Yeah, well, uh, we're nearly there he said. Presently, the porter came and announced the proximity of Potter's home. He held a brush in his hand, and with his air of superiority gone, he brushed Potter's new clothes as the latter slowly turned this way and that way. Potter fumbled out a coin and gave it to the porter as he had seen others do. It was an awkward business as that of a man shoeing his first horse. The porter took their bag, and as the train began to slow down, they moved forward to the hooded platform of the car. Presently, the two engines and their long string of coaches rushed into the station of Yellow Sky. <clears throat> they have to take water here, said Potter from a constricted throat and in mournful cadence as one announcing his own death. Before the train stopped, his eye had swept the length of the platform, and he was glad and rather astonished to see there was no one upon it but the station agent, who, with a slightly hurried and anxious air, was walking toward the water tanks. When the train had halted, the porter alighted first and placed in position a little temporary step. Come on, girl, said Potter, hoarsely. As he helped her down, they each laughed on a self-conscious note. He took the bag from the Negro and bade his wife cling to his arm. 
As they slunk rapidly away, his hangdog glance perceived that they were unloading the two trunks, and also that the station agent, far ahead near the baggage car, had turned and was running toward him, making gestures. He laughed and groaned as he laughed when he noted the first effect of his marital bliss upon yellow sky. He gripped his wife's arm firmly to his side, and they fled. Behind them, the porter stood chuckling fatuously. Two. The California Express on the Southern Railway was due at Yellow Sky in 21 minutes. There were six men at the bar of the Weary Gentleman Saloon. One. One of them was a traveling salesman who talked a great deal and rapidly. Three were Texans who did not care to talk at that time. And two were Mexican sheep herders who did not talk as a general practice in the weary gentleman saloon at all. The barkeeper's dog lay there on the boardwalk that crossed in front of the door. His head was on his paws and he glanced drowsily here and there. Across the sandy street were some vivid green grass plots, so wonderful in appearance amid the sands that burned near them in a blazing sun that they caused a doubt in the mind. At the cooler end of the railway station, a man without a coat sat in a tilted chair and smoked his pipe. The fresh-cut bank of the Rio Grande circled near the town, and there could be seen beyond it a great plum-colored plain of mesquite. Save for the busy salesman and his companions in the saloon, Yellow Sky was dozing. The newcomer leaned gracefully upon the bar and recited many tales with the confidence of a bard who has come upon a new field. Yeah, and at that moment that the old man fell downstairs with the beer in his arms, the old woman was coming up with two scuttles of coal and, of course, well, the salesman's tale was interrupted by a young man who suddenly appeared in the open door. He cried, Scratchy Wilson's drunk and turned loose with both hands. The two Mexicans at once set down their glasses and faded out of the rear entrance of the saloon. The salesman, innocent and jocular, answered, All right, old man, suppose he had. Come and have a drink anyhow. But... The information had made such an obvious cleft in every skull in the room that the salesman was obliged to see its importance. All had become instantly morose. Say, said he, mystified, what is this? His three companions made the introductory gesture of eloquent speech. But the young man at the door forestalled them. It means, my friend, he answered as he came into the saloon, that for the next two hours this town won't be a health resort. The barkeeper went to the door and locked and barred it. Reaching out of the window, he pulled in heavy wooden shutters and barred them. Immediately, a solemn chapel-like gloom was upon the place. The salesman was looking from one to another. But say, he cried, what, what is this anyhow? You, you don't mean there's going to be a gunfight? Don't know whether there'll be a fight or not, answered one man grimly. But there'll be some shooting. Some damn good shooting. The young man who had warned them waved his head. Oh, there'll be a fight fast enough if anyone wants it. Anybody can get a fight out there in the street. There's just a fight just sitting out there waiting for him. The salesman seemed to be swayed between the interest of a visitor and the perception of personal danger. And, uh, what'd you say his name was? He asked. Scratchy Wilson, they all answered in chorus. And will he kill anybody? Well, what are you going to do? Does this happen often? Does he rampage around like this once a week or so? Can, 
Can he break in that door? No, 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 no. He can't break down that door, replied the barkeeper. He tried it three times, but when he comes, you better lay down on the floor, stranger. He's dead sure to shoot at it, and a bullet may come through. Thereafter, the salesman kept a strict eye on the door. The time had not yet been called for him to hug the floor, but as a minor precaution, he sidled near to the wall. So, will he kill anybody? He said again. The men laughed low and scornfully at the question. He's out to shoot and he's out for trouble. Don't see any good in experimenting with him. But, 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 but what do you do in a case like this? What do you do? A man responded, Why, he and Jack Potter, but in chorus, the other men interrupted, Jack Potter's in San Antone. Well, well, who's he? What's he got to do with it? Oh, he's the town marshal. He goes out and fights Scratchy when he gets on one of them here tears. Whoa, said the salesman, mopping his brow. <laughs> nice job he's got. The voices had toned away to mere whisperings. The salesman wished to ask further questions, which were born of an increasing anxiety and bewilderment, but when he attempted them, the men merely looked at him in irritation and motioned him to remain silent. A tense, waiting hush was upon them. In the deep shadows of the room, their eyes shone as they listened for sounds from the street. One man made three gestures at the barkeeper, and the latter, moving like a ghost, handed him a glass and a bottle. The man poured a full glass of whiskey and set down the bottle noiselessly. He gulped the whiskey in a swallow and turned again toward the door in immovable silence. The salesman saw that the barkeeper, without a sound, had taken a Winchester from beneath the bar. Later, he saw this individual beckoning to him, so he tiptoed across the room. Yeah, you better come with me back at the bar. No thanks, said the salesman, perspiring. I'd rather be where I can make a break for the back door. Whereupon, the man of bottles made a kindly but preemptory gesture. The salesman obeyed it, and finding himself seated on a box with his head below the level of the bar, balm was laid upon his soul at the sight of various zinc and copper fittings that bore a resemblance to plate armor. The barkeeper took a seat comfortably upon an adjacent box. You see, he whispered, this here Scratchy Wilson, he's a wonder with a gun, a perfect wonder and when he goes on the war trail we hunt for a hole to hide in naturally he's about the last one of the old gang that used to hang out along the river here <laughs> he's a terror when he's drunk and when he's sober well when he's sober he's all right it's kind of simple wouldn't hurt a fly nicest fella in town really but when he's drunk There were periods of stillness. I wish Jack Potter was back from San Antone, said the barkeeper. He shot Wilson up once in the leg. He'd sail in and pull out the kinks in this thing. Presently, they heard from a distance the sound of a shot, followed by three wild yells. It instantly removed a bond from the men in the darkened saloon. There was a shuffling of feet. They looked at each other. Here he comes, they said. Three. Three. A man in a maroon-colored flannel shirt rounded a corner and walked into the middle of the main street of Yellow Sky. In either hand, the man held a long, heavy, blue-black revolver. 
Often he yelled, and these cries rang through a semblance of a deserted village shrilly flying over the roofs in a volume that seemed to have no relation to the ordinary vocal strength of any man. It was as if the surrounding stillness formed the arch of a tomb over him. His ferocious cries of challenge rang against the walls of silence. The man's face flamed in a rage of whiskey, his eyes rolling and yet keen for ambush, hunted the still doorways and the windows. He walked with the creeping movement of the midnight cat. As it occurred to him, he roared menacing information. The long revolvers in his hands were as light as straws and were moved with an electric swiftness. The only sounds were his terrible invitations. There was no offer of fight. The man called to the sky. There were no attractions. He bellowed and fumed and swayed his revolver here and everywhere. The dog of the barkeeper of the weary gentleman's saloon had not appreciated the advance of events. He yet lay dozing in front of his master's door. At the sight of the dog, the man paused and raised his revolver humorously. At the sight of the man, the dog sprang up and walked diagonally away with a sullen head and growling. The man yelled, and the dog broke into an outright gallop. As it was about to enter an alley, there was a loud noise, a whistling, and something spat the ground directly before it. The dog screamed, and wheeling in terror, galloped headlong in a new direction. Again, there was a noise, a whistling, and sand was kicked viciously before it. Fear-stricken, the dog turned and flurried away. The man stood laughing, his weapons back at his hips. Ultimately, the man was attracted by the closed door of the weary gentleman saloon. He went to it and, hammering it with a revolver, demanded drink. The door, remaining imperturbable, he picked a bit of paper from the walk and he nailed it to the framework with a knife. He then turned his back contemptuously upon this popular resort and, walking to the opposite side of the street and spinning there on his heel, quickly and lithely fired at the bit of paper. He missed it by a half inch. He swore at himself and went away. Later, he comfortably fusillated the windows of his most intimate friend. The man was just playing with this town. It was a toy for him. But still, there was no offer of fight. The name of Jack Potter, his ancient antagonist, entered his mind, and he concluded that it would be a glad thing if he should go to Potter's house and by bombardment induce him to come out and fight. He moved in the direction of his desire. When he arrived at it, Potter's house presented the same still, calm front as had the other adobes. Taking up a strategic position, the man howled a challenge, but this house regarded him as might a great stone god. It gave no sign. After a decent wait, the man howled further challenges, mingling with them wonderful epithets. Presently, there came the spectacle of a man churning himself into the deepest rage over the immobility of a house. He fumed at it as the winter winds attacked a prairie cabin in the north. As necessity bade him, he paused for breath. Or just to re reload his revolvers. Paused. Four. Potter and his bride walked sheepishly and with speed. Sometimes they laughed together shamefacedly and low. I uh, next corner, dear, he said, finally. They put forth the efforts of a pair walking 
bowed against a strong wind. Potter was about to raise a finger to point the first appearance of the new home when, as they circled the corner, they came face to face with a man in a maroon-colored shirt who was feverishly pushing cartridges into a large revolver. Upon the instant, the man dropped his revolver to the ground and, like lightning, whipped another from its holster. The second we weapon was aimed at the bridegroom's chest. There was a silence. Potter's mouth seemed to be merely a grave for his tongue. He exhibited an instinct to at, l at once loosen his arm from the woman's grip, and he dropped the bag to the sand. As for the bride, her face had gone as yellow as old cloth. The two men faced each other at a distance of three paces. He of the revolver smiled with a new and quiet ferocity. Tried to sneak up on me, he said. Tried to sneak up on me. His eyes grew more baleful. As Potter made a slight movement, the man thrust his revolver venomously forward. Nah! Don't you do it, Jack Potter. Don't you move a finger toward a gun just yet. Don't you move an eyelash. The time has come for me to settle with you, and I'm going to do it in my own way and loaf along with no interference. So if you don't want a gun bent on you, just mind what I tell you right now. Potter looked at his enemy. I ain't got a gun on me, Scratchy, he said. Honest, I ain't. He was stiffening and steadying, but yet somewhere at the back of his mind, a vision of the Pullman floated, the sea green figured velvet, the shining brass, silver, and glass, the wood that gleamed as darkly brilliant as the surface of a pool of oil. All the glory of their marriage, the environment of the new estate. <coughs> you know, I fight when it comes to fighting, Scratchy Wilson. But I ain't got a gun on me. You'll have to do all the shooting just yourself. His enemy's face went livid. He stepped forward, lashed his weapon to and fro before Potter's chest. Don't you tell me you ain't got no gun on you, you whip! Don't you tell me no lie like that there ain't a man in Texas ever seen you without no gun. Don't you take me for no innocent, stupid little kid. His eyes blazed with light and his throat worked like a pump. I ain't taking you for no kid, answered Potter. His heels had not moved an inch backward. I'm taking you for a fool. I tell you, I ain't got a gun, and I ain't. If you're gonna shoot me up, you better just begin now. You'll never get a chance like this again. So much enforced reasoning had told on Wilson's rage. Suddenly, he was calmer. If you ain't got a gun, then why ain't you got a gun? He sneered. You been to Sunday school? I ain't got a gun, cause I just come from San Antone with my wife. I'm married, said Potter. And if I thought there was gonna be any galoots like you prowling around when I brought my wife home, I'd have had a gun and don't you forget it. Married, said Scratchy, not at all comprehending. Yes, married. I'm married, said Potter distinctly. Ma 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 married, said Scratchy, seeming for the first time he saw that the drooping, drowning woman at the other man's side. Now, oh, he said, he was like a creature allowed a glimpse of another world. He moved a pace backward, and his arm with the revolver dropped to his side. Is it, is it, is this here the lady? He asked. Yeah, this is the lady, answered Potter. There was another p 
period of silence. Well, said Wilson at last slowly, I suppose it's all off now. It's all off if you say so, Scratchy. You know I didn't make the trouble. Potter lifted his valise. Well, I, 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 I guess I'll allow it's off, Jack, said Wilson. He was looking at the ground. Married! He was not a student of chivalry. It was merely that in the presence of this condition, he was a simple child of the earlier planes. He picked up his starboard revolver, and placing both weapons in their holsters, he went away. His feet made funnel-shaped tracks in the heavy sand. Yeah, so that was that was uh, what they referred to as the sanctity of marriage in the late eighteen hundreds. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so um, thank you all for uh, for joining us for a Stephen Crane short story. Um, the bride comes to yellow sky. I just, yeah, I, 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 I love the, 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 the simple characters in, uh, in that story. It's just adorable. Just adorable. Um, Paul, did I miss my boy, Stephen Crane? Well, you did if you're only just now tuning in, partner. Uh, um, so, um, <clears throat> join us on, uh, well, so there, there, there are going to be two love casts this week. So Thursday, there's going to be the traditional on YouTube love cast at six o'clock. And, uh, then of course, as I said a little while ago, Friday, we're going to do a lineup of all the solo shows on the Vaudacity Network, all in Orange County. And, um, uh, yeah, I'll be doing about a 45 minute love cast and, uh, hanging out in the audience and just drinking with everybody and enjoying all the other shows. And then of course our live Polly's picnic on Saturday the third. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So uh, stay tuned and join us. Um, also, if you would like uh, to know more about the July seventeenth show, I'll be doing a uh, a solo acoustic show in Orange County on July the seventeenth. Um, a bunch of folks uh, in this chat are uh, already on that event. If you are not included on that event and would like to be, send me a private message. I will happily just forward it to you. And, uh, yeah, with... Oh, Julie, thank you very much. The Jameson is waiting for you. That is just lovely. Good to know, because I'm... I'm out at the house, so this is going to be a very dry week leading up, uh, leading up to the weekend. Uh, so I bid you all adieu. Have a safe, fair, and pleasant evening. And uh, have the camera back on and running this coming Thursday. I love you all.